we know after this attack in Russia, this terrorist attack in Russia, in the United States, the officials were talking about that it wasn't Ukrainians who did this, and it was ISIS. With the current information of this attack, with, with what we've seen so far, what's your take on this attack? Well, Nima, the good news is that uh, the people, the perpetrators were apprehended. Uh, they are under uh, investigation. And three more actually were added to the eight that they had apprehended. And so uh, there will be revelations coming out of their uh, of of their interrogation. Um, I'm told just this morning that the cell phones of several of these people who were involved have been looked at completely now, that there are further indications of uh, affinity at least with Ukrainian forces and so forth, and indications that they were headed for Kiev at a warm welcome uh, and honors as as long, along with the rest of the money that they were promised. Now, back to uh, the U.S. Uh, knee-jerk, unprecedented disavowal. It wasn't the Ukraine. Uh, oh, it was not. It was ISIS. Um, the question that you raise, of course, is how could that possibly be? With that, the U.S. would know so soon. Of course, the Russians, everyone else would ask the same, the very same question. After all, I think the, the death toll is now over 140 people at that concert. Now, I mentioned before that we do sort of evidence, right? So we construct chronologies. And, and what we know is that on March the 4th, uh, the U.S. issued a public instruction uh, to U.S. and U.K. citizens, don't go near any big gatherings over the next 48 hours, okay? Because uh, big gatherings like concerts should be avoided, period, end quote. Now, that's how I remember it, at least. That, that was a public warning, okay? Uh, what I gather from other evidence subsequent reports is that was the kind of warning that we gave to the Russian. Now, the CIA has told its its sources to tell people like Cy Hirsch, if you can believe it, no, 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 we gave the Russians chapter and verse. They blew it. It's Putin's fault. I wonder about that. Even the New York Times had earlier stated, yeah, we gave Russia something, but we deleted some of the major details of the attack. Whom do you believe? It's hard to say I believe anything in the New York Times, but I prefer their rendition of this to the cockamamie thing from several CIA sources released subsequently. So I'm going on the assumption that they told Moscow pretty much what the deal was. Now, what's the, the clue in 48 hours? Well, <clears throat> the Russians have a, a Taylor Swift, <laughs> okay? They have a, a fellow named Shaman. He's an incredible performer. And he was coming to Crocus City Hall on the 9th. I emphasize 9th, 10th, and 11th of March. So the warning was on the 7th. If I said something different before, I meant the 7th, okay? The warning was on the 7th, 48 hours, uh, eight, 9. That was the big deal. That was the, the premiere. That's when he started his three evening performance at the City Hall, okay? Come on. Everybody was going to be there. Uh, high dignitaries, everybody else, it would have been a perfect, perfect locale for that kind of terrorist incident to show how powerless, or if not powerless, how vulnerable Vladimir Putin's Russia is, okay? Before the election. Oh, you're saying before, what do you mean? That's the 9th of March, right? The election was on the 15th, 
16 and 17. Perfect, perfect timing, okay? Now, what happened? Well, the Russians, <laughs> it wasn't a, it wasn't rocket science. They took the calendar and they said, here's the ninth, 48 hours. That's two days, right? Okay, 10, here's the seventh, eighth. Oh, God. Probably that concert hall, concert hall was named. Let's beef up security at the Crocus City Hall so that the terrorists don't do this thing or that premiere event. The first performance now now shaman sings patriotic songs one one song is ya ruski i'm russian okay and he always finishes with the, the russian an national anthem okay which he did when he appeared on the 10th we have the video of that did he do that on the 9th <laughs> well yeah but he had to do that because they were probably security forces surrounding him and everybody else. In other words, the Russians built up the security on the knife to a fairly well. And the terrorists, if they showed up at all, say, oh, my God, that would seem to be a good idea. Now that this damn warning went out, we better postpone this, okay? Now, postpone it? Well, if the idea was to embarrass Putin before the election, ah, uh, well... My reasoning is that since the election was 15, 16, and 17, the ninth had long since gone by. Uh, postponing it didn't work for the purpose for which it was planned. So not only, well, let's say the Russians at least relaxed and said, oh, well, we know pretty much what was planned. Thank you, Americans, for telling us in however generalized a way. 48 hours is pretty specific. Thank you for that, okay? We prevented it. And then Putin and the others sort of said, well, okay, uh, the election has gone past. We won hands down, not only record voting for Putin, but record turnout of 77%, can you believe? Okay, well, that's what it was. In, in an election that was known to who was going to, known who was going to win, anyhow. So he gets this great support. I would, uh, I would understand if they relaxed, he dropped down their guard, and uh, said, "Well, shaman's gone. I don't know what else is planned, but let's do some security. But let's not, let's not encumber every, every participant, every theater goer to go through him." You know. uh, and they, so, so the twenty second happened. Now, there are lots of reports now, not only by those CIA sources at the Washington Post that say, oh, no, he kept telling Putin, don't put your leg down, don't put your, don't put your guard down, it's going to happen. Well, I would like to see those reports. Now, they cannot be considered classified, for God's sake. So the only thing that makes sense is if the United States government did warn Russia, and it's possible they did, you know, everything's possible, then they ought to come up, say, up, uh, come up with it and say, look, this is what we sent Russia on whatever time in March, and this is what they apparently disregarded. And failing that, the Russians should come up with those. Now, the Russians are less, less likely to believe, to, to be believed, but there has to be some sort of tangible reporting on this. Meanwhile, the head of the KGB successor, the Slujba Bizaposti, the the Federal Bureau for uh, for Intelligence, that's the FSB, uh, has said, look, um, we pinned it on the US, Britain, and Ukraine. I told that to a little gaggle of of reporters in a corridor. Did he was that a mistake? Doesn't make a mistake. That was planned. Did Putin authorize that? I suppose so. Does Putin believe that? I think it's very likely that Putin does believe it. Why is Putin so restrained? Well, he's not restrained. <laughs> 
He's blowing out the power grid in Ukraine. Putin will not be provoked into doing things that he doesn't really need to do, like answering terrorism with terrorism or taking off after some embassy in, in the West. He doesn't need to do that. All he needs to do is proceed in a very gradual way, attrition, they say a trit, a trit, a trit, until he's uh, given Ukraine a total defeat. Now, this brings us back to that calculus that the U.S. makes. Let's say a total defeat is is clear this summer. The U.S. election is clear this fall. What does Biden, what does Blinken, what does Jake Sullivan, what do the military officers around these folks decide to do? They have no options, none. If they send the most sophisticated weaponry to Ukraine, there are no Ukrainian people equipped to use it. NATO troops would be needed, whether severally from the various nations or from the US only, or from France only. Or So these steps are being kind of raised up on the flag now to see if anybody salutes is the expression we use in the US. Uh, would that be possible? Yes, it would be possible because these people have this great personal incentive not to lose the election, okay? So I don't know what's gonna happen. What I do know is that you can pretty much count on Putin to proceed in a gradual way, not to be provoked in such a way as to endanger the gains that he has already made against NATO and against the US. And the only thing that can, can uh, possibly reverse this would be the use of nuclear weapons, not by Putin, he doesn't need to, but by the US or NATO. Now, are there signs that that's planned? Yes. There are signs. From the negative side, Putin raises occasionally this notion, please don't forget that we have nuclear weapons. Don't forget, just read our strategic doctrine. We will use them if our nation is threatened or if you know there are provocations or they're used against us or against our forces. So don't you understand that? So he says that. Now, from the U.S. side, uh, the public campaign, and let's face the Washington Post, the New York Times are run by the Central Intelligence Agency on behalf of our government. I make no exaggeration there. So let's say this fellow, David Sanger. Oh, he writes for the New York Times. Oh, he's a Pulitzer Prize winner. They got a Pulitzer Prize for reporting on Russiagate. <laughs> he and several other teams, great reporting. In retrospect, it seems that it was all wrong. It seems that it was all fed to him by the CIA, but it was great reporting. So it was wrong. Do they have a way of retracting the Pulitzer Prize now that they don't? I mean, it was wrong. Most Americans don't know that, but it's in court documents, it is in court testimony. Russia Gate was made up by Jake Sullivan, Tony Blinken, and the rest of them, okay? So that's one thing that will come out here. So what's the other thing? David Sanger, back to him, Pulitzer Prize winner. Out of the blue, about six weeks ago, uh, they rerun a, a story that he wrote two years ago when he said Russia is on the cusp of using nuclear weapons to avoid defeat in Ukraine. Huh. Fed again by these usual suspects. Okay. Very extraordinary. Russia was not losing. There was some thought in the West that Russia was running out of ammunition, that, that Russia had no indigenous capability. Of, of, of providing the, the ammunition that they're losing in Ukraine. But those were people, you know, those were fairy tale people. 
I'm sorry. Okay, well, the fairy tale people included the director of national intelligence, Avril Haines, who doesn't know anything about intelligence, knows lots about democratic politics. So, so here's David Sanger saying, my God, you know, we were so, we were worried about the Russians using nuclear weapons. Okay, well, that was bad enough back two years ago. Why did they run that story again? Now, I'm an intelligence analyst. I try to look at things objectively. I'm not Vladimir Putin. Um, it doesn't really matter how I draw a chronology. What matters is what his intelligence analysts draw in terms of their chronology. And I could see them going three weeks ago, whenever it was this Sanger article appeared, going to Vladimir Vladimirovich and saying, uh, Mr. President, uh, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, they were wrong back there two years ago. Why did they run this thing again? Are they preparing the American people? Are they preparing the American people for the use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine? Now, if I were in their shoes, that's precisely what I would be doing. Not to provoke anything, just to say, we can't figure this out, Mr. Putin, except for the possibility that they are preparing to use these things if worse comes to worse. This year, not back then, but preparing the thing. Then back then was when he first published it. Now they're published. Doesn't make sense now. Okay. Unless so. So you've heard me say this before. But if this is even a slight possibility, everyone needs to be reminded of the results of this kind of caper. And uh, Putin tries to remind people, uh, and so do other Russian leaders. Um, they're trying to tread cautiously on blaming for the terrorist event of March 22nd. You know, I have described Putin as a measured, very circumspicious, perspicacious, I should say, person, okay? But even I am a little, a little surprised at how he has so far let his uh, KGB chief uh, talk or national Patrushev, the National Security Council chief, talk instead of Putin. I think it can be explained by these 11 suspects they have now, their cell phones, and trying to come up with the, with the best possible explanation so they can come up to the UN Security Council and say, okay, here it is. Here's what we believe happened. This is why we think happened. We think the US, the UK, the UK and the Ukrainian forces, CIA type forces trained by the CIA and MI6 did this thing by recruiting perpetrators from from Central Asia. This is what we think happened. Now, what will happen? <laughs> the collective West will say, oh, oh Russia, there they, are, there they go again, those Russian liars, okay? Because we already told everybody, people. We already told everybody. Ukraine didn't do it. It was ISIS. Now, if I haven't said this before, ISIS is a creation of the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, it was the so-called successor to Al-Qaeda, okay? Now, Al-Qaeda was not under the full control of the Central Intelligence Agency. We can see the effects of that, right? Uh, but ISIS, ISIS, these people were trained in a place called Al Tant in Syria, right on the Jordan border there. These people were run into Syria to try to depose Bashar al Assad. Um, they, they've been very much under the tutelage of the CIA. Don't, don't take my word for it. Larry Wilkerson, who has even younger contacts than I do, uh, has said that as recently as yesterday on Judge Napolitano's show. He says, ISIS is pretty much created by the CIA. So that doesn't really, <laughs> that doesn't really get the 
Yeah, he left the hook if she was in Ukraine. Uh, look, look, look at ISIS. This is what's going to happen. So, so where, where are we right now? Well, the U.S. They came out and said Ukraine was not involved. Uh, it was ISIS. So what's that mean? Well, there's an adage that I learned. Oh, I learned back uh, a decade or two ago uh, as a result of the KAL 007 shoot down. I think it's so illustrative, Nima, if we have maybe maybe take four or five minutes. Will we have that for me to adduce those details? Yeah. Okay. So I would just uh, I just parenthetically mention that I was active on active duty uh, with U.S. intelligence precisely at this time. The time was 1983. Not coincidentally, the last time we almost came to nuclear war with the Russians. To set the stage, uh, the people who came in with uh, President Reagan thought that the Russians were evil incarnate, that we had to do them in. And there was no ruse that we could choose uh, that would not be justified by uh, putting an end to what Ronald Reagan that year called the evil empire. We're going to build anti-ballistic missiles that could hit a fly in the sky and defend themselves perfectly. Star Wars was what it was called, okay? And we could threaten the Russians left and right. Now, that was the atmosphere. 1983, I was a reasonably senior official uh, at the time. That was the atmosphere when on, I think it was September 1st or 2nd, 1983, KAL, a Korean airline passenger uh, aircraft, 007, was shot down over Siberia. Now, um, what happened? Well, it was way off course. It had 200 and I think 269 passengers on it. And uh, the Russians discovered it. And it was shot down by order of the Russian air defense people in that area. Okay. Um, we learned about it uh, during the Labor Day weekend. And we briefed the, the White House and Secretary Schultz, Secretary of State, Secretary of uh, Secretary of Defense Weinberger. And we said, well, did the Russian shoot this down? Yeah, well, yeah, they did. Uh, was it deliberate? Yeah, they shot it. Down. We have the orders, okay. Then the next day, when we had a little bit more information, uh, I know that Russian air defense experts, US experts on Russian air defense, briefed Secretary Schultz, and he, being an honest man, asked, well, this is really terrible. So the Russians did this deliberately. Yes, sir, they did. We have the evidence. Next question. Schultz, an honest man with integrity. Next question. Did they know it was a passion of plane? Um, mm -hmm. Um, it was the middle of the night. Uh, they signal it to to stop. Uh, they couldn't really see what kind of plane it was, uh, and, and it got the order to shoot. So they shot it down deliberately. Schultz, did they know it was a passenger plane? Answer: No, we, we can't. We can't tell you that. Oh. So what happens? Now, Schultz was not in control of the government. Dishonest men were. Schultz was not in control of his own PR people at the State Department. 
dishonest people were or people who would take orders from Reagan's people rather than from Schultz. And so we know what happened now. So here is something, uh, an interview that I gave right after all this, right after it became clear that the head of the U.S. Information Agency, which was sort of part of the U.S. State Department, but not a really integral part at the time, okay? His name was Alvin A. Snyder. Now, he headed that TV and film division of USIA, and he admitted later to having prepared the fraudulent testimony for use at the UN to blame Russia for a cold-blooded barbaric attack and deliberately downing an aircraft with full knowledge that it was a passenger plane KAL-007 shot down over Siberia on September 1, 1983, killing all, well, I had to figure right, killing all 269 aboard. Now, Snyder had been given a doctored tape. I started to say that, uh, a doctored tape. So some of the some of the exchange of the messages had been cut out. He had been given this doctor tape because it was fixed to, to blacken the Russians by indicating that it was known to be a passenger plane, that the Russians knew it was a passenger plane and they shot it down anyway, okay? When Snyder learned a decade later that the Soviets did not know that the intruding plane was a civilian airliner, Snyder wrote a book, a book he called, quote, Warriors of Disinformation. Hmm. Okay, this is a lesson he drew in his own words, quote, the moral of the story is that all governments lie, including our own. All governments lie. They all lie when it suits their purposes. The key is, get this, Nima, the key is to be the first to lie, to lie first. <laughs> so, I go on to compare that to the situation of the MH17 shoot down, uh, which came of course much later, uh, but it was the same thing the evidence that uh, then Secretary of State John Kerry adduced, saying we had trajectory, we had imagery and other information, it was never it was never given to any court. The Dutch uh, convicted Russians in absentia, but when that same evidence was given to the U, uh, the Court of Justice, the UN Court of Justice, they dismissed it out of hand as saying, "No good." We will not follow up on blaming the Russians for uh, for MH17. So, again, getting back to the to the main thing. Well, whoever lies first wins. Oh, so that was the that was the that was the main lesson for Alvin A. Snyder in writing his book. No note of apology. That's just the way it is. You lie first. Okay, so. To the degree it is possible, and I'm not saying it's proven fact, uh, that the US, UK, Ukraine as a tool, their, their secret services uh, were involved in that terrible terrorist incident in Moscow. Well, what makes good sense from past precedent? You lie and key of all, you lie first because Whoever lies first wins. Okay. Now, <laughs> that having been said, I don't know if that's going to work this time. Uh, it depends. Well, I was about to say it depends on how persuasive the evidence is from these cell phones and from other conversations. And maybe they'll have somebody from Ukrainian services uh, do the right thing and, and, uh, and speak out. But even if that happens, 
uh, it's going to be a propaganda, at least standoff at the UN. Nobody's going to be able to believe those deceptive Russians. And we know from the bat that it wasn't Ukraine and that it was ISIS. So what I'm saying here is that McGovern thinks he knows this. McGovern is human. <laughs> Putin is more important than McGovern. He knows this chapter and verse, and he's a hell of a lot smarter than McGovern, okay? And more important, he's got to make decisions based on this. He has frankly given up on the West. Uh, it is bizarre that after all Biden has done, Putin still professes to believe that he is to be preferred to his earlier to his other to his rival candidate, the earlier president. But that maybe is a token of how uh, Biden looks at a plague on both houses and is is willing to sit back and say, well, what I can do is make sure that I, that I keep uh, I keep a close watch that I pursue Ukraine till the end, that I don't let myself be provoked at anything that would in turn justify Biden or his acolytes uh, from resorting to little things like low yield nuclear weapons. And by and by, whatever happens in the election, uh, the, the truth on the ground will prevail. Uh, Ukraine, unless they work out some sort of sensible arrangement, uh, will be neutralized, and we'll just pre proceed from there. But meanwhile, I can't count on any sensible reactions from from Washington, and not only not only Putin, but Sergei Lavrov, very long serving foreign secretary, uh, who knows more about Ukraine than anybody else, has said precisely the same thing. They call you know it was always very bizarre that. Lavrov and Putin used to call Washington, Berlin, uh, Paris, our partners, our partners, our partner. We talk to our partners. Now they're careful to say our former partners. In other words, uh, we've had bad experience with partners. Partners no longer is the right uh, noun to describe these people. Uh, we'll be as as gentle as possible. We'll call them former partners, even though many of them call us enemies. Again, um, there is a, a dearth of appreciation for the real history of Russian Soviet, <laughs> of Russian American relations since Putin took over. There was a blossoming in 2013 when Putin pulled Obama's chestnuts out of the fire and said, no, you don't have to make war on Syria. We have persuaded them to destroy their nuclear, <laughs> nuclear, their chemical weapons uh, under UN supervision. So you don't have to do that. That was the pick. That was the acme. Uh, Putin, as you know, then talked about increasing trust. Well, that was September 2013. Give the neocons six months and you have the key in Kiev in February 2014. End of increasing trust, decreasing trust, and a plummet in relations to a very dangerous point. I mentioned China before. We now have China and Russia arrayed against the United States. Mm -hmm.